Hello everyone. Previously we have tried to discuss about vectors. We have defined what vectors are. We have also tried to see about the different types of vectors. And at last we have also tried to see about how to operate with vectors. We have also seen that vector can be added or subtracted using geometrical and analytical means. The other thing that we have seen is about vector multiplication. We have seen about the cross product and the dot product of vectors. The sum or difference of two vectors always result in vectors. But the product of vectors might give us scalar or vector, depending on the type of the product. The dot product results in, in scalar, so that it is called scalar product. The cross product of two vectors result in vector, that's why it's called vector product. And the other thing that we have seen is the applications of vector. Some of the common applications of vector have been studied previously, and these are the scalar projection, the orthogonality of vector, whether two vectors are perpendicular or not, the collinearity of vector, whether two vectors are parallel or not. We have also tried to see about how to determine the area of a parallelogram using a cross product and the volume of a parallel piped using a triple scalar product. This was what we have seen previously. And today we'll try to discuss about the most important point about kinematics. Kinematics, we'll try to see about the one dimensional motion and two dimensional motions. So on this unit, We'll try to define what motion is and we'll try to see the different types of motion depending on the acceleration. We'll try to categorize this motion as uniform, uniformly accelerated motion and accelerating motion. We'll try to use the four mo most important equations and apply on some problems. We'll try to define what projectile motion and circular motion are we'll try to see them under two-dimensional motion. So let's proceed on that. First, let's try to define what kinematics is. Kinematics is a branch of physics which studies about motion and motion variables, but not the cause. The cause of motion is force. We are not investigating here about force. We only focus on motion and motion variables. So what is Motion, first, we should have to define what motion is. Motion is the change of position of something with respect to a frame of reference. A frame of reference is something which is very important to designate the location of other objects. Therefore, motion is a change of position relative to a frame of reference. And whenever we are trying to discuss about motion, there are motion variables or parameters, very important motion parameters. And these are position and displacement. Position is sometimes also known to be distance, or usually we call it to be distance. Distance and displacement are the two important parameters or variables. The other variables are speed and velocity. We'll try to see about that, and we'll try to see about acceleration. Position is both position and dista displacement or distance and displacement are lengths. They are lengths. But their difference is that distance it measures the total path lengths between two points. It measures the total path lengths between two points. It is a scalar quantity. Whereas displacement measures the shortest path lengths between the two points. And it's a vector quantity. It's a vector quantity. Suppose here uh, we don't have a particle that it goes with 4 meter to the east. Might move 4 meter to the east. And it might move 3 meter to the north. We can take these two. Whenever we are trying to determine distance, we should have to add all the distance. All the uh, lengths between the two is the total puzzling. So therefore, 4 meter plus and 3 meter gives us 7 meter. 7 meter is the distance between the two points. But if you are asked to find the displacement, it should be the shortest path length between the two points. That means we should have to construct like this, the distance between 
the shortest puzzling is between the two points gives us using Pythagoras theorem it gives us five meters so five meter is a displacement whereas seven meter is the distance therefore distance and displacement are the two important parameters the difference between them is one is to uh, locate the total puzzling the other is the shortest puzzling and the other parameters is speed and velocity a speed measures it is a ratio of distance to that of time because we have said that distance and displacement has a difference this one is color quantity this is a vector quantity the same is true for speed and velocity a speed is a ratio of distance covered per unit time t whereas velocity is the ratio of displacement per unit time t it's a ratio of displacement per unit time t both are measured using meter per second here both are measured using meter for speed and velocity both are measured using meter per second now let's try to see the different types of velocity it's possible to discuss about average and instantaneous velocity average velocity is a velocity between two given time intervals whereas instantaneous velocity is a velocity at a given instant time at a given instant time therefore suppose here let's try to discuss about uh, let's try to give a displacement and that displacement is depending on dependent on time t let's say that x or you can say that s that is displacement as a function of time t 2t squared plus 4 using meter they say that this is the displacement as a function of time t so as time varies the displacement of the moving object or the particle also varies or changes in this case if you are asked to find the average velocity between two time intervals let's say between time t1 is one second and time t2 be two second what is average velocity between the two seconds that might be the question so to find the average velocity you should have to find the displacement at the two different time intervals therefore what is the displacement at time t two second it's possible you should add, it's possible to add these two here and two squared gives you four four times two eight eight plus four gives us 12 meter the correspondent displacement or the displacement of the particle at time t2 is 12 meter the particle is at 12 meter at time t2 second how about at time t one second when you add when you put one here one squared gives you one one times two plus four gives us six therefore the correspondent displacement gives us six meter six meter therefore the average velocity between the two time intervals gives us the average velocity gives us the x2 the time the displacement at time t2 minus x1 over time t2 minus t1 this is what or how we determine the average velocity therefore when you add 12 here when you put 12 here minus 6 over the time t2 is 2 second minus 1 when you subtract this gives you 6 over 1 therefore the average velocity becomes 6 meter per second this is how we determine the average velocity between two time intervals whenever we are trying to discuss about instantaneous velocity instantaneous velocity is a velocity we are asked at a given instant time at a given instant time suppose for the question provided above here we have a particle moving with this function the displacement which depends with time t therefore it's possible to find the instantaneous velocity like what is the instantaneous velocity of the particle at three second at three second therefore to find uh, the instantaneous velocity we should have to use a mathematical approach known as limit or derivative actually you have learned um, this at, in your mathematics lesson so it's possible to use the derivative techniques or the limit techniques therefore it's possible to derivate these functions and find the instantaneous velocity how do we derivate well it's a mathematical approach we should have to use derivative we, we should have to put these two here to v is equals to the derivative of displacement 
by dt. It's possible to find this like this. Two brought here. Two then brought the power of two to the coefficient. Then t, you should have to subtract one from the power plus four has no power, means t to the power of zero. Whenever you put zero here, four into zero gives us four. Whenever you derivate constant numbers with respect to time, is zero. Therefore, this gives us four times t. Four times t is the velocity with respect to time. Then we have asked to find the instantaneous velocity at a given instant time. Suppose the time is three seconds. Therefore, the velocity instantaneous at three seconds means we should have to put four and the time is three seconds. Therefore, this gives us 12 meter per second. 12 meter per second is the instantaneous velocity of this particle at one second, at a single second, and that second is three seconds. Whenever you are asked to find average velocity, it should be the average velocity between two time intervals. So these are the two important terminologies. And the other point here is it's the same is true for acceleration. Acceleration also, we have average acceleration and then instantaneous acceleration. To find the average acceleration, it's acceleration between two time intervals. The velocity function at time t2 minus velocity at time t1 over t2 minus t1 is average velocity. Whereas we are, if you are asked to find instantaneous acceleration, it's acceleration at given instant time t. Therefore, it's possible to use the derivative of uh, velocity function. Now let's try to see about types of uh, motion. Depending on acceleration, we do have three types of motion. On a given rectilinear or motion along a straight line, we have three types of motion depending on acceleration. What are they? And these are uniform motion, uniformly accelerated motion, and accelerating motion. The parameter is acceleration. For a uniform motion, for a uniform motion, acceleration of that body is zero. We do have zero acceleration. That means the acceleration is zero while the velocity remains constant. For a moving object, the velocity remains constant. Okay? The initial velocity of that particle is the same as the final velocity of that particle. Therefore, the motion is said to be uniform motion. Uniform motion has constant velocity. If the velocity is constant, the acceleration is zero. We know that we define acceleration as the final velocity minus the initial velocity over time t. But velocity initial and velocity final are equal. If you put these equal, if you subtract equal numbers, it will give you zero. Therefore, keep that for a uniform motion, acceleration is zero, but velocity remains constant. And here, for a uniformly accelerated motion, the acceleration remains constant. The acceleration remains constant. The rate of change of velocity remains constant, or the acceleration remains constant. One good example is free fall, or vertical motion, is a good example of uniformly accelerated motion. When an object is thrown downward or upward, we are using gravity, and gravity is always 9.8, or approximately, for calculation, 10 meters per second square. So the acceleration remains constant. The velocity changes, and that velocity changes per unit time t remains constant. Here, the velocity, the velocity remains constant, acceleration is zero. But for a uniformly accelerated motion, acceleration is constant. Whereas accelerating motion is the motion in which the acceleration itself varies with time. Here, the acceleration remains constant, and here the acceleration is zero, but for accelerating motion is a motion in which its acceleration itself changes with respect to time. So keep this in your mind, and we mainly focus on these two types of motions. We focus on uniform motion and uniformly accelerating motion. And the big four um, equations or mathematical formulas used for uniformly accelerated motions are this, and this say, it says for uniform horizontal motion, or it might be for a free fall vertical motion. For a uniform uh, horizontal motion, the big force can be, the big four equations can be given us, the average velocity is equal to the initial velocity plus the final velocity over time t2. The final velocity is equal to the initial velocity plus acceleration time t, and remember that this acceleration is constant. 
And the final squared is equal to velocity initial squared plus twice of acceleration times displacement. And displacement S is equal to velocity initial T plus half times acceleration T squared. Look here, the acceleration remains constant. If you are trying to use this equation for a uniform motion, acceleration will be cancelled out here, here, and here as well. So, for a uniform motion, you'll have, for a uniform motion, uniform motion, the only thing that you have is this equation. S is equal to velocity initial t, velocity initial t. But velocity initial and velocity final are equal. In this case, velocity initial and velocity final are equal. If it is for a uniform motion, for a uniform motion, the velocity remains constant. And the velocity average is the same as the initial, is the same as the final. Therefore, instead of using velocity initial or instead of using velocity final, it's possible to use velocity average. So displacement S is equal to velocity average times T. It's possible to use this one for a uniform motion. But usually use this equation, the big four equations, for a uniformly accelerated motion and keep this in your mind. And for, for free fall, for objects thrown upward or downward, remember that you should have to convert the acceleration using gravity. Using gravity. For an objects which are thrown downward, you should have to use a plus sign here. And for objects which are thrown upward, you might use minus sign convention. And note that gravity is always positive, 10 meter per second for calculation purpose, for calculation, okay? So keep this in your mind. For a uniformly accelerated motion, we have to use these equations. It's also possible to uh, represent motions using graphs. We do have a displacement versus t graph, velocity versus t graph. It's possible to have acceleration versus t graph. So we can have such a graphical representation. For a uniform motion, we have said that acceleration is zero. Acceleration zero, and the velocity remains constant. And the velocity, displacement versus t graph, the slope shows us a velocity, and the slope remains constant. So note that, starts from acceleration, for a uniform motion, acceleration is zero, so we have zero acceleration. It is overlap on time t, on horizontal graph. So the acceleration remains zero despite the change of time t. But here, it shows you velocity versus t graph, the acceleration is zero, but the velocity remains constant. At initial time, the velocity doesn't change. At some other time, the velocity doesn't change. It remains constant. Here as well, for displacement versus t graph, this shows you for a uniform motion. But for a uniformly accelerated motion, the acceleration starts from acceleration. The acceleration remains constant. Despite the change of time t, the acceleration remains constant. Suppose here, if the acceleration is uh, four meter per second squared, so at time t zero, at time t one, at time t two, at some other time, the acceleration remains constant, okay? But here, the acceleration is zero. When you come here, the ver velocity versus t graph it shows you on this direction, the velocity changes. The velocity changes from zero to two, three, four, and, and the like. And the acceleration remains constant, meaning the time, the difference, the change of velocity between h and every interval remains constant. The acceleration it remains constant, but the velocity increases, increases. The same is true. Here we'd have a displacement s is equal to velocity initial t plus half a t squared. We have, uh, parabolic uh, relation on displacement s. If the initial velocity is zero, you can put it here zero, one over two, a t squared. It shows you a parabolic relation. So this is for true for uniform motion and this is true for a uniformly accelerating motion. Now let's try to see about motion in a plane or two dimensional motion. So far we have tried to see about one dimensional motion. Either the object is moving horizontally or the object is moving vertically. Both shows you one dimensional motion. But in this case, we are trying to see a two dimensional motion, meaning the object moves in both direction or the object has both components, the horizontal and the vertical component. So two dimensional motions consist both horizontal, meaning along the x-axis and vertical along the y-axis. So in such motions, we have different quantities. Previously, you have seen the basic parameters, the displacement, the velocity, and the uh, acceleration. All these components have the horizontal and vertical component. 
So displacement have the horizontal vertical component, uh, velocity as well, acceleration as well. So we'll try to see those things in uh, motion in a plane or two-dimensional motion. The two important two-dimensional motions are projectile motion and circular motion. So first, let's try to see about projectile motion. Projectile motion. Suppose you project a given uh, particle or a given object at an angle of theta from horizontal. So let's see here. Suppose you are trying to throw something upward from horizontal at an angle of theta. At an angle of theta. You just project it with an initial velocity, V0. Then the object that is thrown is called projectile. Projectile. We call it to be projectile. And that projectile has a trajectory motion. Trajectory means which is represented by quadratic or uh, parabolic, or it's possible to say semicircular uh, pattern. So it has such a pattern. If you are throwing something, it will move like this and falls apart at some point there. Therefore, here we have the initial velocity. The initial velocity has horizontal and vertical component. At every point, it has horizontal and vertical components. The displacement as well has horizontal displacement and vertical displacement. When we are trying to discuss about acceleration, the acceleration along the horizontal component and the acceleration along the vertical component on a projectile motion is a consistent of two different types of motion. The horizontal projection tells us about uniform motion, uniform motion. The horizontal projection or the horizontal component of a projectile motion is uniform motion. And previously, we have said that uniform motion has zero acceleration. Therefore, the horizontal component acceleration is zero because that projectile motion is uniform motion. Projectile motion, the horizontal component of projectile motion is uniform motion. Uniform motion. Keep this in your mind. Okay? If the acceleration is zero, it's uniform motion. If it is a uniform motion, the velocity remains constant. You have to keep this in your mind. But the vertical, pro the vertical component of a projectile motion is uniformly accelerated motion. It is uniformly accelerating motion. So that the acceleration due to gravity is used instead of A along the y-axis. So we can use gravity. gravity. So we have the horizontal, the vertical component. To understand this concept, let's try to see at some points, some common points. Let's start with the initial point here, at some point here, and at the maximum height here. And finally, let's try to see at point 4. So when we are trying to see uh, at point O, or at the original point, there is an initial velocity, V0. V0. The object is launched with an initial V0. And this V0 has horizontal and vertical component. The horizontal component, the initial velocity V0 along x. It's possible to say the initial velocity horizontal component V0x. And the horizontal component can be determined using your mathematical or trigonometric relation, sine and cosine relation. So if I use cosine, cosine theta means adjacent over hypotenuse. The hypotenuse is the initial velocity V0. And the adjacent is the horizontal component of this uh, velocity, V naught x. So V naught x over V naught. From this, the horizontal projection is known to be, or the horizontal component of the velocity is said to be V naught cosine of theta. This is how we determine the horizontal component of the initial velocity. And the vertical component of the initial velocity can be determined using sine. We know that sine is opposite over hypotenuse, therefore v naught y over v naught. And when you crisscross, you can find that the horizontal initial velocity component can be given as v naught sine theta. And one thing is the horizontal component and the vertical component. When you add these two, that means it's a vector quantity. You should not have to add linearly. Rather, you should have to use uh, parabolic condition, or you should have to use a trig condition. Therefore, the square root of v naught squared and vi squared under root gives you v naught, or the initial velocity. Suppose here you do have, let's take an example. The object is thrown with an initial velocity of 100 meter per second at an angle of theta b 53 degree. 
Suppose that the object is launched at an angle of 53 degrees. Then what is the horizontal component of this velocity and the vertical component of this velocity? Well, to find the horizontal component, the initial velocity along x gives us the initial velocity is 100 meter per second and the cosine of 53. Cosine of 53 is given or known to be 0 0.6. So 0 0.6 times 100 gives us 60 meter per second. So 60 meter per second is the horizontal component of the initial velocity. Whereas the vertical component can be determined as v naught y v naught sine theta. This is how we put v naught is 100, the initial velocity is 100, and sine 53. Okay, sine 53. Sine 53 gives us 0 0.8. 0 0.8 times 100 gives us 80, 80 meter per second. Look here, 80 meter per second is initial vertical component and 60 meter per second is initial velocity horizontal component. When you add these two, you are not going to add it linearly. Like 80 plus 60 is 140. This should not be the way. Because it is 60 meter per second in the i direction, in the x direction. Previously, we have learned about vectors. And this one is projected in the j component. It's moving in the j component. So what is the total velocity? You have to find the resultant velocity using this one. So 80 squared plus 60 squared should give us 100. 100. This is how we determine the resultant vector. This is at the original point or at the initial point. Now let's try to see what if the particle is moving and reach somewhere at point 1, at point 2, at different point t. At time t, it's possible to find the velocity v. We know that you do have uh, four basic equations. Previously, you have said that it's possible to find the final velocity is equal to initial velocity plus acceleration times t. This is how we determine the final velocity. The final means it is a velocity after time t. Suppose you project the given particle at 100 meter per second, what would be the velocity after two seconds or three seconds, something like this. So to find the velocity v, you should have to have the horizontal and the vertical component, so you should have to use x and y, meaning the final velocity along horizontal x should be equal to the initial velocity along x plus acceleration along x t. This is the way how to find the horizontal projection after time t. And it's also possible to find the final velocity along y, the initial velocity along y plus acceleration along yt. Okay? We know this equation. The only thing we have done is along the x, along the y, the horizontal and the vertical projection. That's what we did. But we have said that there is no acceleration along the x-axis. There is no acceleration uh, on the horizontal component of the uh, projectile motion. So what does it tell us is the initial velocity component. Previously, we have found it to be 60 meter per second. We have said that one, we just launched it with 100 meters per second at an angle of 53. The horizontal component is found to be 60. So this 60 meter per second doesn't change despite the change of time t. At one second, it is 60, remains there. At two seconds, it remains 60. At any time t, the horizontal velocity remains constant. That's why it's called uniform motion. The horizontal component is called uniform motion so that the velocity remains constant. But the vertical component depends on the vertical acceleration and that is gravity. That's gravity. Therefore, the, uh, suppose at point 1, what would be the final velocity? So to find this at point 1, here, at point 1, it's possible to find the velocity component among the big four equations. We have the v and y means the vertical component along the y at some other time t. v naught sine theta minus g t. Here, we have said that v final y, or it's possible to use v y, the final velocity, meaning that velocity at a given time t. The initial velocity component, previously we have said that it is v naught sine theta, sine theta. And plus here, we have to put the gravity. Gravity, acceleration along y is gravity either plus or minus. We have a sign convention to use a plus sign when the projectile is moved downward, whereas minus sign when the projectile is launched 
uh, upward. Therefore, this is launched upward. If it is launched upward, you have to use the negative g. But suppose on a given elevation, you might uh, project something downward. Okay, you might throw something downward. At that moment, you can use plus sign. So plus or minus gt. Therefore, in this case, we are since we are launching upward, we should have to use the minus sign. The minus sign. This is a sign convention. Mostly, we use this sign convention. We have different sign convention. About three uh, type of convention, but the most common sign convention is this one. Therefore, it's possible to use the vertical component vy is equal to v no sine theta minus gt for a projectile projected upward. Okay. If it is projected downward, we can use the plus sign. So keep that at the initial component. The horizontal velocity can be determined v naught cos theta. The vertical component can be determined v naught sine theta. But at a given time t, after a certain time t, the horizontal velocity component remains constant since the motion is uniform motion. But the vertical component can be determined using the time t, okay, minus gt. So previously you have found that the vertical component of the initial velocity is 80 meter per second. Suppose what is the velocity of the vertical velocity of this particle after two seconds? Let's say that after two seconds. So to determine the vertical component of this projected after two seconds, vy is equal to v naught sine theta minus gt. This is how we put our equation. And the time given is two seconds. So when we put this, the initial velocity component, we have already found it to be 80 meter per second. Okay? Minus gravity is 10. We are asked to find the vertical velocity component after two seconds. Therefore, we should have to put two. Therefore, it is 20. 80 minus 20 gives you 60 meter per second. Now look, the vertical component gradually decreases. After one second, it becomes 70. After two seconds, it becomes 60. After three seconds, it becomes 50, and the like, and the like. So at last, it reaches at the maximum height. Okay? You have launched it to be 80 meter per second for the example that we have given. 80, 70, and the like. And as it reaches to the vertical, to the maximum height, the vertical component becomes zero. Okay? At this point, the vertical component becomes zero at maximum elevation. But we have said that the horizontal velocity remains constant. Here, uh, initially, we have found it to be 60 meter per second. At point 0.1, it is 60 meter per second. At point 0.2, 60 meter per second. Everywhere, it remains constant, the horizontal velocity. But the vertical velocity gradually decreases, and it risks here to be zero. Then gradually, it increases, 10 and the like. Okay, it increases and decreases. While it reaches here, it becomes 80, 80 meter per second. While it reaches here, it becomes also 80 meter per second. So this is a projectile motion, and some of the common equations are this one, the initial components, this one, the vertical components after a given time t. It's also possible to find to discuss about the uh, horizontal and vertical displacement. So far we have tried to discuss about the time interval, uh, the velocity components, the horizontal and the vertical components at time t. Now, how do we determine the displacement, the horizontal and the vertical displacement? We know that the displacement equation is displacement s is equal to velocity initial t plus half a t squared. This is the general equations that we use for uh, uniform or uniformly accelerated motion. And we should have to decompose this displacement into horizontal and vertical. For horizontal, we use x, okay? We use x. And for vertical, we use y or h sometimes. Therefore, the horizontal displacement can be rewritten as, instead of s, we use x. Instead of velocity initial, along its horizontal, v naught x t, plus half, the acceleration should be horizontal ax squared. But we have said that the horizontal acceleration is zero for uh, projectile motion. So this can be uh, zero. This one is zero. Therefore, the horizontal displacement can be given as x is equal to v original x plus t. And we know that the initial velocity component can be given as v naught cosine of theta. Okay, v naught cosine of theta times the time t. This is how we determine 
the horizontal displacement. Okay. Whereas to determine the vertical displacement, we know that this is the general equation. Instead of using S, which can use Y or H. Okay. Let's use Y. Then the velocity V0 should be the vertical component V0 yt plus half times acceleration along yt. But the acceleration along y is a gravity, so we use g. And the velocity V0 sine theta, the vertical component, the initial velocity component is V0 sine t. So we use plus or minus. We have said that for upward minus, for downward you can use plus. So this is how we determine the velocity uh, component, the displacement vertical component. So y is equal to v naught sine theta t minus half gt squared. This is true for uh, the case that we have. Previously, we have launched vertically upward at an angle of 53 degree. Suppose, what is the distance, uh, the horizontal and the vertical displacement at time t two second. If we are asked to find the displacement at time t two second, we know that x is equal to v naught cos theta. We have already determined it to be 60. From our previous example, it is 60 meter per second. Here we have a time variable. Therefore, if you are asked to find the displacement of that projectile object at, after two second, you should have to use two second. After three second, you should have to use three, whatever the time is given. So in this case, the horizontal displacement is 120 meter, 120 meter. How about the vertical elevation of that projectile? Therefore, here we have the initial velocity component it to be uh, 80 meter per second, okay? And you should have to put time t two second. We have to use two minus one over two. Gravity is already 10 for calculation. And the time is two second squared, okay? Therefore, this gives us 160, and this gives us 40. You can eliminate uh, 2 squared 4, and here 20. Therefore, when you subtract these two, this gives us 140 meter. The vertical elevation of the projectile becomes 140 meter, and the horizontal projection uh, or the horizontal component is 120 meter. Let's see the our, our projectile here. Suppose after time two, two seconds, it might reach here. Okay, the horizontal displacement x is 120 meter, and the vertical elevation is becomes 140 meter. So this is possible to determine the horizontal and the vertical projection. And at maximum height, at maximum height, this is the maximum possible vertical height. It's possible to find the time intervals. Okay, at point two means at the maximum possible elevation. It's possible to use the time interval. While the projectile reaches at maximum height, meaning as it reaches here, as it reaches here, it took half of the flight. Okay, the time it took is half of the total time flight. Suppose the total time flight is 20 seconds. If it is 20 seconds, it took 10 seconds to reach its maximum height, and the other 10 seconds to reach backward. Therefore, keeping this in your mind, the time it took at uh, it reached to the vertical height can be determined using Vy, the vertical component, V naught sine theta, since it is projected upward, minus gt. So half time flight can be determined using this equation. And the vertical at its maximum height, the vertical velocity is zero. We have said that it is 80 at this moment. For every second, it decreases and decreases. While it reaches its maximum height, the vertical velocity component is zero. So we can substitute here zero and find an equation. OK? Here, it's possible to find half time flight. Half time flight, because that we have v naught sine theta minus gt that the vertical velocity component is zero. So V naught sine theta minus G, the time interval, we can call it to be a half time flight, half time flight. So we can have this equation. This is the equation used to determine half time flight, half time flight. And to find the total time flight for the total projection of the projectile, you can double this time. The total time flight becomes twice of the half time flight. Okay, half time flight. It's possible to find that. So substituting this time t 
on the vertical, velocity, the vertical displacement component, you can determine the maximum height. So V naught sine theta times th minus half times gt squared is the uh, way we are trying to determine the vertical component or the vertical height. But instead of time t, we can use half time flight. If you are trying to substitute here and here, you can find this equation. And this equation is very helpful to determine the maximum possible height for a projectile. For a projectile. So the initial velocity component squared sine two theta, I mean sine squared theta sine squared theta or sine theta squared are all the same over gravity G. Okay. Here H maximum can be given as V naught squared sine squared theta. Sine squared theta over gravity uh, G. This is here we have uh, such an equation, so it's possible to find the maximum possible height. Here, it's also possible to determine the uh, maximum horizontal projection, okay? The maximum possible horizontal projection. To determine this maximum horizontal uh, projection, uh, here, sorry, we do have two, okay? When you subtract these two, we can have two. So V naught squared sine squared theta over 2G is the maximum height. This is how we determine. Now, to find the maximum horizontal projection, the maximum horizontal projection is sometimes called range. So to find that, we should have to use the maximum possible time. As the projectile reaches to the maximum horizontal projection, meaning at half time flight, it reaches to the maximum height. But at the total time flight, it reaches to the maximum horizontal projection. And this maximum horizontal projection is called range. That's why we use R. So how do you determine the maximum possible horizontal projection? We know that X is generally given as V naught cosine of theta times T. Here, look, if we use time T to be the total time flight, if you are substituting the total time flight, which is twice of half time flight, it's possible to find the possible maximum displacement or the range. So maximum horizontal displacement is determined at time t is twice of half of the time flight, t half. Therefore, let's substitute the half time flight, double unit, or twice the half time flight. Let's see here. Here, the half time flight is given to be V naught sine theta over G. But when you multiply it by two, you can find it to be the total time flight. And instead of time T, you can substitute this one, it's twice of V naught sine theta over G, so that it's possible to find X. And the X maximum, or we call it to be range, R is equal to V naught squared sine to theta over G. Look here, it says sine to theta. From your trigonometric concept, sine to theta means twice of sine theta cos theta. This should be the way. Sine to theta doesn't mean, okay, doesn't mean twice of sine, sine theta. It is not the same as that of this. It is not the same as twice of sine theta. These are not equal. So whenever you are trying to calculate, note that sine to theta means twice of sine theta and cos theta, cos theta. Therefore, it's possible to uh, determine the horizontal maximum uh, horizontal component or range. It's possible to determine the vertical component at maximum. It's possible to determine the velocity component at different locations. So these are uh, the most important points. So far, we have tried to see about one dimensional motion. Uh, we have seen about uh, defined motion and we have tried also to see to classify different types of motion depending on acceleration. We have also seen about the uh, projectile motion or motion into dimension. Uh, since uh, one of the two dimensional motion is projectile motion, we have seen about projectile motion so far. So this is all uh, that I have got for today. Next time we'll try to see about circular motion. Thank you. Goodbye.